it's Greg Brown. Grab your logbook because it's time for Flying Carpet Podcast Flight Number 16, World War I in the Air. Some of you know me from my long running Flying Carpet Aviation Adventure column in Flight Training Magazine or from my popular aviation books. I'm a former National Flight Instructor of the Year and a Barnes and Noble Arizona Author of the Month. I'll share more about my activities following today's episode. The Flying Carpet is a four-place, single-engine Cessna 182 light airplane. In it, my wife Jean and I have long traveled the North American continent, searching behind clouds for the real America, and experiencing aerial adventures like today's all along the way. Learn more at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, where you can also see photos from today's episode. And join me on social media by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet. You'll notice I'm currently doing no sponsored advertising, so if you enjoy my podcast, please treat the flying carpet to a gallon of Avgas via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Better yet, please consider subscribing. Thanks in advance. Today, since you patiently waited a while for my next episode, I have what I think you'll find to be a treat. I've always been really interested in World War I, and as you'll learn, I had access to some materials about World War I aviation that were new to me. And even those of you who are history buffs and probably know much of what is in this podcast are going to find some surprises in there. I can pretty much guarantee it. So hop aboard my flying carpet, buckle up your seatbelts good and tight, and prepare for takeoff on today's adventure, World War I in the air. Clear prop. It all started with a coffee mug, inscribed with a quotation. The engine is the heart of an airplane, but the pilot is its soul. Each morning before flying, I imbibed that romantic bit of aviation philosophy with my caffeine, becoming ever more entranced with each dose. Sir Walter Raleigh, The War in the Air, 1922. That was the attribution. Within days after getting the mug, I began searching for Raleigh's book. When I visited libraries and then antiquarian bookstores in those pre-internet days, nobody had ever heard of this book, nor did it appear in books in print. Fruitless author searches led only to the Raleigh we studied in school from America's colonial era. At some point, the Scottsdale Public Library reference desk offered to do a search, but I heard no more about it. Months passed, and having exhausted all avenues, I had to satisfy myself reading that provocative saying with my morning coffee. The engine is the heart of an aeroplane, but the pilot is its soul. Then one day my phone rang. This is Shelley at the Scottsdale Public Library, Interlibrary Loan Desk, she said. We've located the books you requested. Uh, which books are those, I asked. Let's see. Something called The War in the Air, being the story of the part played in the Great War by the Royal Air Force, by Walter Raleigh and H.A. Jones. It was like encountering a long-lost friend at the neighborhood cafe. Great, I replied after overcoming surprise. When can I get it? Now that we've found them, getting them here should only take a week or so. Do you want the books one at a time or all at once? You mean there's more than one book, I asked, thinking I'd misheard the first time? Yes, she said, seven volumes plus two map folios. Seven volumes? Sounded like some sort of reference work. Well, I told her, please send them to me one at a time. But despite my request, the library proceeded to deliver all seven volumes plus two cases of maps. 
the arrival of this encyclopedic work didn't go over very well at home because, first of all, lacking storage space, I stacked them on the bedroom floor in front of my dresser. And secondly, my wife soon tired of hearing me read her passages as we settled in for bed. But more seriously, the library phoned as I delved into the first volume, saying, Your two-week checkout period is over, and these books are non-renewable. I said, you got to be kidding. I mean, you delivered me seven volumes, and each of them is hundreds of pages. I'm supposed to read the whole set in two weeks? Ultimately, I phoned the lending library in Manhattan, Kansas, the folks who had sent the books to Scottsdale, and I asked, hey, do I really need to return all these books after just two weeks? It turned out the books hadn't been checked out since the 1940s, so I was approved to keep the books until finished reading them. The War in the Air turned out to be the fascinating official history of the British Air Services in World War I. It covers the 11-year history of powered flight up to the Great War, and then addresses every aspect of aerial logistics, strategy, and technology on a mission-by-mission basis. From the first tentative attempts at aerial combat, to German Zeppelin raids, and formation of the world's first independent air force, the series covers all stages and theaters of the first ever war in the air, based on official records and eyewitness narratives. In them, I discovered contemporary first-hand accounts of the dawn of aviation, detailing virtually every aviation war mission in which the British were involved around the globe. The first volume contained Raleigh's provocative 1922 quote. He turned out to be a descendant of the famous 16th century Raleigh we studied in American history. Unfortunately, Raleigh died after finishing the first volume, and then another fellow named H.A. A. Jones wrote the other six volumes. Leave it to the British that six volumes later, you still don't know H. A. Jones's first or middle names. What I find intriguing about World War I is that it marked the transition from Civil War era military strategy and technology to those of the 20th century. We find horse and wagon transport alongside modern machine guns and telephony, the development of tanks and radio, and yes, airplanes. In 1914, when World War I began, safe flight in and of itself was not a given. The primitive aeroplanes of the day frequently fell apart in mid-air, dashing their pilots to horrifying deaths. Procedures today's pilots take for granted, such as night flying and recovery from stalls and spins, were largely considered impossible. Many World War I aircraft were powered by rotary engines, primitive devices with radially mounted cylinders that spun with the propellers around fixed crankshafts bolted to the airframe. That's right, the whole engine turned with the propeller, improving cooling at the slow airspeeds of the day and saving weight through mechanical simplicity, but aggravating handling due to gyroscopic effects of that big spinning engine. Rotaries had no carburetors, fuel was distributed by centrifugal force to the cylinders, and therefore they had no throttles. The engines ran wide open all the time, so to reduce power, pilots pressed a kill switch suspending ignition to the spark plugs. Blip, blip, blip was the music on final as pilots blipped engines on and off for landing. Overhauls were required as frequently as every 10 hours on these engines. The difference between maximum structural speed and stall speed was as little as 10 miles per hour on early aircraft, with death lurking at either margin. As I mentioned, stalls and spins were considered unrecoverable in the early days, and structural failures were common at higher airspeeds, still far below the cruise of a modern Cessna 172. Rotary engines were lubricated with castor oil, centrifugally distributed with the fuel. There were no return lines, so used lubricant streamed back over the fuselage and the pilot. And this is one reason why early aviators wore scarves, to wipe castor oil from their faces in futile attempts to stave off its effects on bowels and stomach. 
Perhaps most incredible of all, pilots at the height of the war in 1916 received as little as eight hours of training in these difficult and unstable aircraft, a fraction of what modern pleasure pilots receive flying far tamer aircraft. No wonder their lives were measured in only weeks upon arriving at the front. Airplanes at the outset of the war were so anemic that few were capable of climbing even to 10,000 feet, and those that could often required an hour or more to get there. Accordingly, the use of aircraft at the beginning of World War I was limited to artillery spotting and reconnoitering enemy ground forces. Even when a few daring souls first decided to take war to the air, their armaments were initially limited by meager aircraft lifting capabilities to pistols, rifles, and perhaps a few hand-dropped grenades or 20-pound bombs. Since the early airplanes lacked enough power to carry fixed guns and ammunition, authorities experimented with other methods for vanquishing opponents. One provocative scheme called for airplanes to carry wire with a grappling hook. The idea was to snag your opponent's aircraft with the hook and slide a bomb down a cable to blow it up. Think about that. Anyway, once aircraft became powerful and sturdy enough to carry machine guns, the problem arose of where to mount them without threatening one's own propeller. Pusher airplanes with rear-mounted engines and propellers were an early solution, with a gunner-slash-observer perched in front of the pilot firing a pivot-mounted machine gun. But these pushers were slower than the more conventional front-engined aircraft they were often chasing. The gunner blocked the view of the pilot, and it was difficult for the gunner to aim the gun in the three-dimensional dynamics of air combat. In the meantime, pilots of front-engine aircraft experimented unsuccessfully with obliquely mounted guns requiring them to pull up alongside the enemy to fire sideways. Frenchman Roland Garros was the first individual to mount a forward-firing machine gun on a single-engine tractor airplane meaning with the propeller in front. He accomplished this by mounting steel wedges on the back of his wooden propeller blades and firing through it, the idea being to deflect random bullets that hit the propeller wedges. Garris shot down several German planes with this arrangement before going down himself behind enemy lines. There's some dispute as to whether he shot himself down or if he experienced mechanical failure. But in any case, the Germans captured the airplane and invited famed aircraft designer Tony Fokker to look it over. Fokker turned the tables after examining this captured airplane. He engineered the first practical interrupter gear, which synchronized the machine gun with engine RPM so bullets would pass between the spinning propeller blades without hitting them. This feature was introduced on Fokker's Eindecker monoplane, which for months afterwards was the scourge of the sky. That advance of mounting machine guns so you could aim the plane instead of aiming the gun marked the beginning of modern fighters. Some of the most striking accounts in the war in the air regard Germany's Zeppelin dirigibles and British efforts to combat them. As we've discussed, Britain's early fixed-wing aircraft could carry almost no ordnance, at most just a few tiny bombs hand-dropped over the side. Obviously, it was hard to inflict any damage with those. But the Germans had Zeppelins, huge, rigid dirigibles lifted by a series of internal hydrogen-filled ballonets. By the beginning of World War I, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin had already been refining such aircrafts for some 15 years. As a result, the Germans boasted a fleet of well-developed lighter-than-air craft powered by half a dozen engines that could carry large crews, defensive weaponry, and several tons of bombs over tremendous distances. These battleships of the sky were phenomenal strategic weapons, when you consider that opposing forces were armed only with airplanes that could barely lift their one- or two-person crews. Everyone in Britain was scared to death of the Zeppelins when the war started, 
because the Germans had the ready capability to fly them from Germany to bomb England, which they proceeded to repeatedly do for several years. One interesting Zeppelin feature was a fish-shaped sub-cloud car. As the name suggests, on cloudy days, this one-man pod could be lowered 800 to 1,000 feet below the airship on cables to cruise beneath the clouds. From the sub-cloud car, the observer could share navigation and scouting information with the Zeppelin's commander by telephone. Turn left. Turn right. Guiding the Zeppelin from below the clouds. One of these sub-cloud cars actually got a little too low and struck a cliff, ejecting the occupant. He was on the lam for a few days in the English countryside before being captured. Pretty crazy stuff. Early in the war, there were no purpose-built anti-aircraft guns, and the British fighters could not fly fast enough or high enough to intercept the Zeppelins. So the airships bombed in daylight from seven or 8,000 feet. But as British fighters and anti-aircraft defenses improved, the vulnerable Zeppelins were forced to switch to night raids when they would be harder to spot and attack. Now, I mentioned earlier, night flying in airplanes was widely considered impossible at the beginning of World War I. So many aircraft crashed attempting to land in darkness that doing so was deemed unnatural and therefore impossible. Not until the British were forced to deal with nighttime Zeppelin raids were early night flying procedures developed. Since at first only the enemy was flying at night, British pilots initially practiced night flying techniques in daytime using dark goggles to avoid alarming the populace and triggering anti-aircraft fire. Simultaneously, the British developed powerful spotlights to illuminate the raiding airships so they could be attacked. Another problem was that even when fighters did occasionally reach the Zeppelins, their bullets simply passed through the airship's fabric and out the other side without doing significant damage. The British invention of tracer bullets in 1915 finally addressed the dual challenges of directing bullets in darkness and igniting the dirigibles hydrogen gas bags. Tracer bullets incorporate a phosphorus-magnesium mixture that burns brightly and hotly when fired. Once ignited, Zeppelins were goners. As the war went on and British defenses progressively improved, Increasing losses forced the Zeppelins to fly higher and higher because their only real defense was altitude. By late in the war, Zeppelin quote-unquote height climbers were operating at altitudes over 20,000 feet. Life now became very difficult for Zeppelin crews. Imagine doing battle from a heavily armed gas bag filled with highly flammable hydrogen. There was no way to acquire and purify inert helium in those days, so hydrogen was the only option. Of course, little was known about the upper atmosphere in 1915 and 1916, including weather, mechanical impacts, and human physiology. Zeppelin hulls iced up, their engines quit, and the mechanics riding in engine gondolas were too hypoxic to service the dead engines. Eventually, the German crews were provided with oxygen, which they sucked from tubes. What's more, no one knew about the jet stream. Now, Zeppelins cruised at about 80 miles an hour. But winds at 20,000 feet often exceed that speed. These height climber Zeppelins were blown out over the ocean, they were blown into neutral countries, they were blown into enemy territory, lots of places to crash. No wonder some 80% of airship crewmen did not survive the war. Finally, the Zeppelins lacked navigation and bombing accuracy, finding and attacking blacked out targets from high altitude at night. So German commanders would return to base and report they'd bombed Coventry 
But British newspapers would report the next morning that three cows were frightened in a field where the bombs fell. Zeppelins dropped many tons of palms, but the vast majority fell in the countryside. Although the airships were very effective as terror weapons, they did comparatively little damage to life and property, even dropping so many tons of bombs. However, they did succeed in diverting precious British military resources from the war on the continent to defensive measures at home. Finally, the War in the Air series delivered some intriguing logistics background associated with the world's first air war. Raleigh reports that there was such a shortage of magnetos to power engine ignition systems that the opposing forces would steal magnetos off downed enemy planes and adapt them for use on their own. And here's a scary one. Only German pilots were issued parachutes as the war progressed. Allied commanders were concerned that if their pilots had parachutes, they might not stick with the airplane as long as they should during battle. That's a pretty scary situation, so when a British or French airplane caught on fire in battle, the pilot was faced with the choice of burning up with the plane or jumping out without a parachute. We're so used to thinking in contemporary terms that it's easy to forget that nobody knew what an air raid was before World War I. When Zeppelin armadas began bombing England in history's first mass aerial assaults, British authorities had to develop mechanisms for alerting the populace. To identify approaching Zeppelins, they set up listening stations along the British coast, consisting of giant bell-shaped structures much like old gramophone horns. Upon hearing engine noise approaching over the English Channel, these listening station operators would transmit warnings through a dedicated telephone system. Air raid alerts were initially delivered in London by policemen on bicycles carrying signs saying, Take cover! These were hardly prominent enough to overcome the din of daily life, much less hurry the populace to shelter. When raids ended, the bobbies would hop back onto their bicycles with all clear signs. These were, of course, impossible to see from shelters. So then the bobbies turned to yelling all clear while riding through the streets. Still, few of the citizens could hear them from places of shelter. Of course, when the Germans switched to night bombing, bicycling bobbies with signs were rendered totally useless for air raid alerts. The siren in its present form had not yet been invented. So authorities tried all sorts of audio warnings, such as bells. After much experimentation, someone proposed firing mortars with blanks for air raid alerts. Nothing beats the sound of gunfire for urging people to shelter, so the mortars proved very effective and were quickly implemented. But that still left the problem of sounding all clear, as no one's likely to leave shelter at the sound of mortar fire. So what was the ultimate solution for sounding all clear following World War I air raids in Britain? Police drove open cars through the streets, carrying Boy Scouts blowing bugles. Is that not great? Okay. Next, I'd like to read you a little exchange and see if you can identify what military service these titles come from. Ardian Smith? Banneret Whitecliffe reporting, sir. At ease, Banneret. I'm most impressed with the performances of Flight Leader Jones and Reeve Patterson in the recent air battle. In fact, the Reeve's exemplary performance inspired a letter from 2nd Ardian Thompson of your regional HQ recommending Patterson's promotion to Banneret. You have much to be proud of. Thank you, Ardian, sir. No one deserves promotion more than Reeve Patterson. So what is this, a conference between alien officers and next year's Star Wars sequel? No, this is how discussion might go in Britain's Royal Air Force had the list of ranks proposed at its inception been adopted. 
For most of World War I, British air operations were conducted by the Royal Flying Corps, a branch of the British Army, and the Royal Naval Air Service, affiliated with the Royal Navy. But by 1918, the growing strategic importance of air power, along with inter-service rivalries and questions about effective chain of command, led the British to organize the world's first independent air force, equal in stature to the British Army and Royal Navy. With no tradition of ancient air armadas to draw upon, there was interest in creating officer ranks unique to the new Royal Air Force. Among the proposed ranks were Ardian, Reeve, Banneret, Second Ardian, and Flight Leader, all but the last being chivalric titles from medieval knighthood. Not that things would have turned out any differently militarily, but imagine how different the hierarchy of the world's air forces might sound today had those proposed ranks been adopted instead of simply adapting ranks from the Army and Navy. Mr. Prime Minister, Ardian Smith has arrived, bringing with him Banneret Whitecliffe, Reeve Patterson, and Flight Leader Jones to receive their decorations. Show them in. Now let's depart the war in the air for a brief postscript revealing just how unreliable airplanes were even at the end of World War I. Shortly after the war, famed aviation writer Antoine de Saint-Exupéry began flying surplus World War I aircraft on Aeropostale's Paris to North Africa airmail route. These airplanes suffered engine failures about every 10 hours. So the company put two aircraft on the route. For each airmail flight, they assigned one full airplane and one empty airplane. So if an engine failure forced the plane carrying the mail to land, the empty one could touch down, take on the mail, and continue to the destination. Just to add richness to it, at the time the Sahara was populated by lawless Arab tribes. So downed and captured airmail pilots were often tortured to death or ransomed back to the Aeropostale company. So next time you're sidetracked by thunderstorms, imagine a flight environment where your engine fails every 10 hours over trackless country inhabited by hostile tribes. The Great War seems a very long time ago, but it's astonishing to consider just how short the history of aviation actually is, and our proximity in time to those World War I fighter pilots and Zeppelin crews. Many of us older pilots knew Great War veterans in our use. I well remember my step-grandfather showing me the pinch in his arm where a World War I bullet wounded him. In fact, if you consider the small percentage of human beings who've ever piloted an aircraft, you realize that each of us pilots actually has a measurable role in history. I myself have been flying for over 40% of the entire history of powered flight. And some listeners will have flown for over half the history of powered flight, or more. Perhaps the biggest thrill in treading hundred-year-old skies is realizing that in many ways the adventures of early aviators still parallel our own. Sure, no one's shooting at us, and thankfully today's aircraft are not prone to spontaneous disintegration. But the underlying adventure of leaving Earth to challenge the atmosphere remains unchanged. Flying is as exciting today as it was a century ago, just a whole lot less dangerous. The engine is the heart of an aeroplane, but the pilot is its soul. That quote rings just as true today as it did when Sir Walter Raleigh wrote it a hundred years ago. I hope you've enjoyed today's Flying Carpet podcast episode, World War I in the Air. Check out associated photos at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com. I should mention that when I first read The War in the Air, there were only a handful of complete sets around. I later bought one at collector prices. 
But these days, The War in the Air, Volume 1, can be read for free online. And even if you read only that first volume, you're in for a treat. But if, like me, you get hooked and want to read the rest, all the volumes have recently been republished and are available online to order. I've posted links to access the War in the Air books for those who are interested, and also a link for Old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in New York, where you can still see authentic World War I aircraft fly. Please help me continue this podcast by sharing your favorite flying carpet episodes on social media, by posting reviews on your favorite podcast directories, and by donating via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Thanks in advance for your support. For more aviation adventures, check out my book, Flying Carpet, The Soul of an Airplane, for which I was named Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. Also at gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, learn about my other popular aviation books, The Savvy Flight Instructor, The Turbine Pilot's Flight Manual, Job Hunting for Pilots, and You Can Fly. There you'll also find my views from the Flying Carpet Aerial Photography, available in fine art metal prints, and pilot achievement plaques, perfect gifts for celebrating and commemorating yours or your favorite aviator's piloting accomplishments. Finally, I invite you to follow my social media sites, most of which can be found by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet, search GB Flying Carpet on Twitter. And consider joining my student pilot pep talk group on Facebook. Thanks again for joining me on today's Flying Carpet Cockpit Adventure. Music by Hannes Brown. See you next time.